Hello and welcome to the second part of our vlog cast on bumps. Um, we're going to dive straight in here and we're going to have a look at Gunther. On the left side you see him skiing on a normal steep black run. On the right he is in the actual zipper line. Fundamentally, Jamie, you agree it's the same. Yeah, a little bit like you said in an earlier podcast or one of these uh, video vlog casts, whatever they're called about transferable skills. Um, I been in the gym. If you don't have a range of movement in the gym in a, on a dry land scenario, it won't be there when you're in the mountain. So what you can see there is Gunny, Gunny's turns almost look identical on pistas they do off or in the variable yeah. terrain in the mogul field. And all he has to be aware of, and obviously he is, is that the bump sharply drops away from him in this zip line. And he, and we'll talk about this, needs to map that style of terrain combined now with the double hit of having a virtual bump and the bump itself. We've spoke briefly a couple of times about this virtual bump and we will explain it further in one of our later vlog casts um, with carving. Probably easier to do it then. Yeah, and just to go back to that, I think if you can't do it on the piste where you've got that level pitch and there's no undulation, you're not going to be able to do it when the undulation's there. Or it's going to be you know, you might have a fluky run or whatever, but I think that's the key is developing skill sets on the piece first and then taking it into, yeah. the, into the terrain that you're looking to get into. When we look at our first student, um, he is in his 60s, um, but making a good effort down this um, bumps run. What I want to point out here um, is how the mechanics are breaking down. So if we look at the position of myself on this still shot or video you can see the big rounded curvy back the kink in the back of my neck and then you look at Steve go down and I want you to observe as he's going down as I draw in these arrows and point to this like noddy head position thing going on and this is a good sign of um losing the um tension the stability particularly from activation of the glutes and hamstrings and on top of that also there'll be issues definitely if we look at this within the psoas or the iliopsoas the the hip bender that is at the front as well what do i mean by that well the type of drill that we can test this on is when we on the dry land for example you pull your knee in like this close to your body close as you can without creating extension in your back neutral back and you let go of your leg does it suddenly want to pull down and drop down that would be a sign of some sort of mobility or strength issue within the psoas area and what we often see is you look through some of these drills our students get the opportunity to do all this stuff when they're with us obviously in the the fitness studio these drills are quite useful for people. A lot of people, I do see them, especially cyclists and things, they want to be stretching these muscles, etc. But sometimes it's not stretching them that's the problem, Jamie. It's actually the problem that they don't have strength in these muscles. So you use the word, I uh, don't even know, iliacus or something like that, some Latin word what we're talking about there you're talking about a psoas 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 yeah these are the things. the the muscles um the psoas is a very um prominent muscle that that goes from your lower back and works its way down to your femur so it's often weak in people it's it's a common thing within running as well so having the the strength will be helpful to steve of being able to understand his um, glutes, hamstrings, and psoas, using off-hill drills will be helpful. Equally, obviously, I appreciate, like all of you, people want a fix on the hill. They don't just want somebody like me taking them off the mountain and going, oh, you've got to do all these drills, but I genuinely believe they will help. Um, Especially but course, with the current situation of lockdown, you've got a lot of time in your house at home to be going through some stuff that's going to aid you for the next season when you next get back on snow. 
Absolutely. So take this time to try and simulate and address some of these weaknesses. And with some of these tests that I'm showing on the screen, these are the type of things which will highlight if you do have a weakness in this area. And of course, if you are older, then it's likely you will have these weaknesses and therefore it will benefit you to strengthen them. Meanwhile, let's, you know, looking at Steve, he is managing to, to fight his way in there. He's working as best as he can to keep his stance underneath him. I think for me, obviously, Steve come down to me. I've got to give him feedback. I can't go into the, all those different muscle groups and everything like that with Steve and for him to understand that. I need to give him some quick feedback. Steve's always looking for a long answer, so I might have to break it down a little bit technically. But it's just there's either a restriction of movement within his, within his lower limbs where he's hitting the back of that bump and that energy is traveling up because there's not enough absorption suspension in the legs that energy is traveling up his body his core's not active enough so it's the energy is dispersing there and he's pitching forward and creating that uh, bobbing of the head so i would have to then take him out of the bump line on the piece maybe he's work on you know more of awareness of the core and stability in the body and getting more range of movement in that leg or addressing the timing issue as well um there's you know there's many ways to shave a cat or whatever the saying is Okay, never heard of that one before. Um, yeah, so he is crashing against the bumps. There's no doubt about it. Um, we can look further at another skier. Um, let's look at somebody who's having... Um, yeah, so let's look here at the skier going down. And what we see in this case, um, it's great to have Gunther next to him as well because what I want you to be aware of is how he has issues where it appears when we look at him like his outside knee that he should now be using knee rotation or knee angulation isn't present it's almost like it's supinating it's it's moving to the outside whereas Gunther he so can clearly flat, see flattening off as opposed to edging flattening his ski off now, this could definitely be an issue within this sub-tailor joint um, that you may have heard of within skiing. And when we don't have access to that and we don't have the understanding of that, um, people will have this problem where it will be a situation where the foot will look like it's supinating. Now, on the piste, it will be interesting to see how this lad skis his short turns because I think he probably um, does a relatively dynamic short turn and maybe he doesn't show this same motor pattern. Yeah, as, as well, I think because he mistimes his movement and he uses the back of that bump as a braking mechanism to reduce his speed down there, he's pushed himself off his axis. As you can see, he's in a complete straight line, whereas Gunny is, is, is well stacked and he's got different angles between his, Especially his lower leg. fib yeah. and his femur. Yeah, that's the, that's the key issue here. He is falling inside basically at this stage, whereas Gunther's basically stacked up and he doesn't have many angles basically from the knee up over. It's straight, isn't it? All the angulation is happening lower down in that sub joint and then in his knee. And that is why, once again, I would ask you to address the Vimeo channel where we look at knee rotation because it's, again, something that people aren't aware of. You know, people think the knee's a hinge joint. And look, the knee is at the mercy of your ankle and hip and the knee's just stuck in the middle. And if you're not doing the correct things with your ankle and hip, then your knee is screwed. And that's when these sort of things happen. So I think this guy was called Jack. This is 2016 or something like this. Or, okay. Um, I think he's called Jack. And I, I'll be taking him again out of the bumps. And for me, I think it is a timing issue as well. If, you, if we played this video, which we we'll probably will, we'll play them both going down the same pitch side by side. And then um, Gunny's getting two bumps into Jack's one. Let's call him Jack for now anyway. And uh, I would just probably take him on the piece and from a certain piece mark to the next. Okay, let's go down and see how many short turns we can get. Keeping that body still and having the accuracy of the pole plant. And then let's go back or similar pitch, similar distance. Let's just keep on trying to get more numbers without losing the accuracy of movement, without losing shape to get those faster feet. Just to keep it super simple where you're not really, you're not limiting mileage or anything like that or slowing the client down. 
you're getting them moving. Then also, again, if we want to go in the gym, you've got your ladder drills or something like that to get those fast feet. So he is have the ability to move that little bit quicker from left to right, where the terrain's dictating the rhythm of the turn. As yeah, possibly where he turns. could understand like cutting drills. A lot of the problems within um, sports was you know people would be pulling their hamstrings and grinds and things like that injuries because in their off season they were training very linearly, you know, like straight yeah, lines. But sport is generally acceleration, deacceleration, stopping and cutting, moving left to right. In skiing, that's really important that people have the ability to understand how they can cut left and right. So when these NFL players or whatever they are doing these cutting drills, as they're moving left and right, they're not going up because in effect, it's a waste Absolutely. of energy. Yeah, so, so in that, running terms, this is very important. And we mentioned it on one of the um, vi um, videos that I cut together is saying about um, vertical oscillation in running is, is exactly that. It's not forward motion. Therefore, it's something we try to avoid with runners. And instead, we want hip you're, drive. You're taking more time from stride to stride. In effect, take more time if you're moving upwards, moving from turn to turn. And on top of that, what we're doing is we are um, having the body weight crash down every time you take a stride, which is why you see the mechanics of running falling apart. So in effect, a little bit like Steve in that previous run. Crashing down. Crashing down on the platform with that yeah. slight mistake. So in effect, if we look at a basketball player jumping up and making a, a dunk, whatever they're called, you can clearly see his hips elevate and continue to elevate. This is phenomenal how high they are able to spring up in the air. But... We don't want that type of mechanic. Instead, I would draw your attention to the weightlifter here who is actually doing the opposite. Yes, this triple extension, i.e. he is extending to maximum with his ankle, knee and hip, but he is pulling himself under the bar. So that drop squat that was spoke about in the last session. Yes, we have some videos here where you can see us doing a little bit of this drop squatting and trying to get people to understand about retraction of the legs and how important it is. I think on top of that, it is worth mentioning because when we looked at Steve's run that, you know, I showed you this picture, for example, and here you see Steve and I together. Um I'm, ex I'm making a big extreme example of the back. Now, obviously within weightlifting, weightlifting requires us to work mostly in the sagittal plane and therefore like squatting, lunging, etc. However, skiing is a little bit different and that is why we are keen to um, show our guests about spinal mechanics and make sure they understand, yes, midline stabilization is very important, but... We have to understand that there will be, in effect, what people might see as a bit of a butt wink, what we call in squatting, tucking under of the lumbar spine as the pelvis and the femur are working in this rotary fashion. But that probably happens when we're talking maximum range of movement. Probably, lower, yes. Lower range. So if we look at high-end mogul skier, for example, here, Jamie, we see in this mogul skier, especially as we watch them from the side. This is what I'm talking about now, this rotary action here. When that one, you can see the butt's coming underneath. underneath. So the pelvis in effect is making a, uh -huh. a rotation underneath. Yes. But whereas we can see the, the upper back. The, the thoracic same... spine, yeah, you want to be careful. I mean, I, I try to keep thoracic extension, what we call, but, but this guy's down, yeah. got definite it's rounding. Very... It's pretty much at one angle. He's, he and is then, apart from vertical. And part from it, and he kind of has to use it as a bit of an absorption, but... Okay. Because the, the, the typical reason that he's in this position and he's very upright is because if he made that immature squat position, so where the body goes forward, that is the type of action you make when you're blocking or you're stopping yourself. Yeah, so in effect, you stop you if the spine came forward, there'd be limited movement for the legs. And there'd be limited movement so for the legs. you blocking yourself, so you wouldn't be able to necessarily absorb the terrain that he's on when mm -hmm. it's super deep and steep or as i said if he wanted to stop in his case this is where this hip drive comes in so you heard me on the first blog when jamie was talking about this thing here that you're looking on the slide where you see me trying to move the tip of my ski up and down and i sort of jamie asked me the question are you matching the angle of the back of the bump by pointing you know using your feet 
and I sort of mentioned then and sort of said something about the hip. And the reason was because I want in bumps, I tend to focus a lot on hip driving forward. Um, although a lot of people talk about, you know, you should always be talking feet first, feet steering, feet this. Um, and it's true because the feet are close to the ground and therefore they are your first um, sensory perception. But in the bumps, I think the movement and the constant movement down the hill of the hip and not blocking the hip from you traveling over the bump are paramount. I think it's a bit like what we said earlier on. If we watch um, your legs of Martin or somebody like that come down, which we'll look at, or Franz, is they just move out the way of the bump. They allow inertia, gravity to pull them down the hill and they just move the legs in the ski, the platform, out of the way of the terrain. They just allow inertia to, to pull it down, pull them down. Yeah, they're the, the making it easy. <laughs> and And again... I'm sure they're not thinking that much at this stage, like many people will be trying to work out what they're supposed to do. But as Jamie says, he's about to hit the back of the bump. He's now using the tail of the ski as the fulcrum, as the pivoting point at this point. And we see how good and quick he is at driving the hip forward and allowing him to get onto the back of the bump. Now, that action there that he has looks very much like um, this slide that I'm going to show you here, where you see Gunther and I next to each other, where we are talking, and I, I sort of briefly spoke about this. We, we are having to get a position of matching the back of the bump, so we get a feeling of almost pressure on the back of the bump, um, and edging which is one of the critical factors when you look at many of the next skiers in the bumps, Jamie, is that they're flat. They're like, the skis are just flat on. They've got no ability to make this action. And I know, you know, you see me here testing Jamie's internal rotation from his hip and external rotation. It's something we do with the groups because that's going to be important um, in these moguls because that's a very uncomfortable position to get into if you're not used to having that feeling of tip engagement like that. When we look at, again, uh, um, Mick, a bit older as well, my sort of age, um, he, again, is demonstrating this lack of ability to use the subtalar joint to create knee angulation, to be able to get that sensation of, of feeling the edges and the tip of the ski biting um, what I think if I had, if I was on the hill with Mick, is I'd want to see his ability to bring his turns squashed together. If we think, and you see me draw this shape here on the screen now, and you see how this is possibly what's going on with his turns, but I want him to make this tighter style turns because he's always dropping too far down. So in effect, if that was your piece... If he did on his normal style turns, if he got 10, you would expect him that same uh, distance. To do 20. To do 20 <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. But without losing the shape. Without losing the... Yeah. Not, and not, not by just kicking around and pushing. I'd expect him to be able to make first single turns, build up to linking turns, where he can feel the tip engagement and what tip engagement does. And that is why it's important when you look at some of the videos here, where you see me um, demonstrating that, of the idea of moving your weight further forward on the ski or moving your weight to the middle or to the back. Once again, it's the golden rule of fore and aft. Yeah, and also for me working with these clients um, as I'm on the hill most of the time, it's it's just convincing that most people do skiing as a leisure activity and they don't do too much with the platform. And then when they're taking it into one of the performance strands, they're expecting all of a sudden to have all this performance. So it's convincing them early on that it's a, it's a sport and we've got to put something in to get it, get something out. You've got to put a, a, a load of stuff in to get minimal out a lot of the time. So it's it's convincing these guys to put some physical effort in, get them to feel what it is to actually do this sport, to work with all those forces or work against um, those kind of forces. Yeah, so 
as we said before, just to be clear about this idea of how you see there are no angles between Gunther's knee right up to his head, this is what the skiers look like going down. They are far more inside, and that means if one thing's going that way, the feet are going to go the other way. We're pushing, and this becomes very difficult in a rut line, especially where you have no time to think, and it becomes a blocking action. Well, especially if you were inside in that period of the turn, because in effect you'd be on the wall coming into the trough, and the bump would be pushing even further back and inside. Yeah, as you're already in that position already, so it's it really is a bump. France here, they tend to stay much more dynamically low. Even when he comes to make the extension, as he hard edges, I would say that he's not just opening his knee because like I say it's stuck between his hip and his ankle but relatively that's more to do with his hip um, than it is to do with knees because if he used his knees he would end up skiing like a bit like a piston so it would be going up and down like this and I know you know a lot of the time it's explained like that however what you're seeing with these skiers is more of a road to reaction um, and that would be more appropriate because there's no stopping of motion. Whereas in a piston type motion, you, you see it with Steve, he pushes down, hits the ground, bounces back up to the high point, and it's going this way. Whereas we want a sensation of it going more rotational, and that means the, the huge amount of movement uh, capacity he has in his... Um, hip will certainly help him combined with the huge amount of strength you have in the glutes hamstrings quads and then the iliopsoas for example to help so in conclusion there's no one real way form because depending on the client and everything you're going to be constantly wanting to change your approach to how you deal with the bumps yeah it's just figuring out obviously the, the whoever you've got in front of you or, or whether you're doing your own training for yourself and trying to progress from these videos next season it's 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 what works for you or your client um exactly so the way jamie does it and the way i do it don't have to agree um i may be you know champion of the world of saying hey i want to get them off the piece i want to control their mobility i want to to get them stronger or whatever but as Jamie well knows, not everybody wants to do that. A lot of people just want to ski to get better in skiing, and that's not my way. But I think as well, it's just generally just having that, it's getting that cue that works for you that allows you to access your subconscious where you're going to ski better. So it's building up things repetition-wise. Again, we we'll talk mass practice all the time on the piste, and then in the bumps of, like I say, I think about squeezing my poles, that's it. And then I, I ski my bumps the best I'll ski them. And it's, it's having that cue that you've done all these movements, you've done all this repetition, Let's go out and play with it. And what's going to switch me on to my performance? And in fairness, as Jamie said there, even at his level, he's thinking of one thing. I do genuinely believe coaches need to be disciplined not to overkill it and to give too much information. One of my main weaknesses as a coach, and I have to address that constantly. You have weaknesses? Is, okay, slight weakness, <laughs> is that I could overkill something and you have to be aware of the audience in front of you and remember we want to do we don't want to stand around listening to me talk this is what lectures are for that's what gondolas are for they're for standing and talking the rest of the times for skiing yeah and as well going into, into talking about like you know the one focus and being in the subconscious I'm feeling everything. So we've done exercises to work on push pulling of the feet. We've done exercises to work on range of movement, to work on steering, to be aware of the body and everything like that. I'm feeling all those things, but I'm having one focus that allows me to go out and kind of be thoughtless, be my subconscious and tune into everything that the platform's telling me, my body's telling me. If you can be a better feeler, um, more proprioceptionally aware, um, then there's no doubt you are going to be better at many sports, um, no matter what it is. Yeah, again, it's that transferability. Yeah. Good. Well, we hope you enjoyed this second part, and we'll see you again soon.